our time of worship here um, with our call to worship and we usually do this by singing and I invite you to sing our Advent response together which is O Come, O Come Emmanuel. We'll sing this through once all the way and then we'll go back up to the top and I'll give you a little story or something to think about in between the verses. Okay? Here we go. Yeah. 
just close your eyes. I'm a little emotional today. And maybe some of you are as well. And sometimes we can't control when these things come out. Part of it is the busyness of the season, right? Everything, especially this year, is condensed into four weeks of Advent. Have you already been experiencing Christmas before it has arrived? Not even enjoying the time when we journey to find the Christ child? I know that I've been rushed into it, and perhaps you have been too. So I'm so grateful that you've joined us here today to quiet our minds and sit still for a moment. just like they did today. And I could not even phonate the last line. And my voice just seized up and tears were coming down my eyes. And the most lovely gift that the congregation gave me was that they sang the last line for me, just like you are doing today. So just know that your presence is a gift, even if you're just sitting in the congregation and participating. Back to the top. Right. 
worship here at Fourth Presbyterian Church. I think the great thing about this service and the other services is that you are welcome to be here however it is. And sometimes that shows up with an outpouring of emotion, <laughs> like I'm having right now. Sometimes that shows up with joy in your feet as we sing our songs. And it's okay to clap, it's okay to dance, it's okay to be here just as you are. You'll notice in the pews, there are these green connection cards. I invite you to please fill one out. Uh, let us know that you're here. And on the back, if there's anything that's on your mind, whether it's a thank you or a concern that's on your heart, I always encourage people to write it down and leave it there, even if it's just for the hour. And when the offertory is collected, set it aside, put it in the plate, give it away, surrender it. Uh, we will pray over those cards. We will reach out. And We have some great worship leaders with us today. This is Brian, our bass player, Neil on drums, Amar on piano. My, my name is Mina. We have Pastor Rocky and Pastor Nancy with us here today. And we're also graced by the Gospel Choir Voices of Light, and we'll hear from them during our offertory time. After the service, if you'd like to get to know us better, there is a time for coffee and something sweet in the narthex, and we enjoy it. We invite you to come enjoy that and meet those who are around you. We'll continue our time of worship today by singing our opening hymn, which is Let There Be Peace on Earth. And I now invite you to rise as you are able in body or spirit to sing that song with me. Tis the season. and then you guys can join me. Uh, and then each time she speaks, we will respond by singing. Let's try. 
prophet Isaiah says, we all fade like a leaf and our sins like the wind take us away. We all fade like a leaf and our sins like the wind takes us away. Trusting in God's mercy, let's confess our sins. God of the future, you are coming in power to bring everything under your reign. But we confess that we aren't expecting that rain, for we live casual lives, ignoring your promised judgment. We accept lives as truth, exploit neighbors, abuse the earth, and refuse your justice and peace. And so we acknowledge Christ our light. Christ be our light, shine mercy forgive us give us wisdom to welcome your way and to seek things that will endure when Christ comes to judge the world in mercy and so we acknowledge Christ our light Christ be our light shine The prophet Isaiah also says that the wilderness will rejoice, the dry land will blossom, the people of God will return with joy and singing. Friends, God's grace is our joy and God's peace is our song. And so we sing, peace, peace, peace on earth. Please take some time now. Oh, sorry. We'll sing first and then we'll take time now. to greet those around you with words and gestures of peace. this response, okay? Here we go.
so you're stuck with me. <laughs> um, but I was prepared to preach. It wasn't that, like she was going to preach and I had to step in, so don't worry. Uh, a couple of things just to share with you before we get into our scripture and uh, sermon. Bina very graciously in, welcomes people and um, introduces the folks who are part of the service. There's a couple of other people I want you to know are here and do help lead this service every week and invite you to consider if this is a service and a time that's meaningful for you each week and you want to become more involved and maybe help out during the week. People like Gordon there in the back greets people, Anita who led scripture, Louise, James is around here somewhere. There's a, a core group of people who help welcome folks uh, at this service and make it be what it is and we're grateful for them and if that's something that you think you might want to do some Sunday at this service just tell me uh, afterwards I'll be drinking coffee and eating cookies. Um, so as uh, Bina mentioned we are in Advent and because Christmas Eve is on a Sunday this year uh, we will not have this service on Christmas Eve, which means we get three Sundays of Advent. Today, the 10th and the 17th. So be aware now as you're planning for this service, this, or for what you're doing on Christmas Eve, there's five services in here on Christmas Eve. 10 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, rock. <laughs> but not this service. And then on New Year's Eve, the following week, the 31st, there's a evening, what we call a taze service. It's a slow contemplative worship service at 6.30 in the evening. That will be happening instead of this service on the 31st. So after December 17th, we're not back here together at 2 o'clock until January 7th, just so you all know. All right, that's it for the announcements. Let's hear from Scripture. Our um, Scripture text for this first Sunday in Advent is from the prophet Isaiah. It's from the 64th chapter. So listen to these words. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you are angry and we sinned because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen? So we sang O Come, O Come, Emmanuel at the start of worship today. I hope you like it because we're going to sing that at the start of worship every Sunday of Advent. So two more after today. <laughs> because it is the beginning of Advent, this season uh, in the church calendar that is focused on expectation and waiting for Christ's arrival among us. O Come, O Come, Emmanuel is a song that's been around for a really long time. It's based on an ancient prayer that's even older than that. It's a really long song as well. It has like at least seven verses, the first of which is the most well-known, right? O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here. What I think is so great about this song for Advent, which 
If you're not familiar with Advent as a, as a season, I didn't grow up in a church that celebrated Advent. It is the four weeks that lead to Christmas where we focus on um, patience and waiting for Christ's arrival. What's great about this song for Advent is that it situates us in the experience of an ancient people, captive and exiled people waiting for deliverance. So here comes the history lecture portion of the sermon. Around 597 BCE, the southern half of the kingdom of Israel in the Bible was called Judah, and it was besieged by the armies of Babylon and their king, Nebuchadnezzar. The capital city, Jerusalem, was completely ransacked. The temple was reduced to rubble. This temple that had been built hundreds of years earlier by King Solomon. Many of the residents of Judah were carried off forcibly to Babylon as exiles. It's one of the most important events in biblical history. And the author of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel locates the people to whom Jesus was born, locates them in that, in that period of exile, at least figuratively, because that exile did come to an end. The temple was rebuilt. Jerusalem was rebuilt. But for the next several hundred years, nothing was like it had been before. For the next several hundred years, the people of Israel lived under the thumb of occupying empires. Okay, so that's the history lecture. When we sing this song, it feels like we are also figuratively placing ourselves in that moment of captivity and exile as well. And I think... That identification happens in the very first word, the very first letter, O. O, it's, it's an exclamation, happens in the Bible a lot. O is a, is a groan, it's a cry, it's a fist-raised shout at the sky. It's a lament, O, it's a lament. And sometimes... Lament is the most faithful thing that we've got. We are now squarely in the holiday season. So talking about lament maybe feels counterintuitive, like uh, maybe even a little depressing. The lights are already up on Michigan Avenue. There's fresh greenery, banners, purple pyramids hung in this space. Christmas is barely three weeks away. And yet, and yet, for some of us, for many, this season that we are in is the longest, hardest season of the whole year. It is dark. <laughs> in a couple of weeks will be the longest night of the whole year. We have a worship service here that night to commemorate the longest night. Look at the worship order. There's information about that. It's gray. It's cold. I, I don't know what this season feels like for you personally, but I know that for a lot of people, this season cannot end soon enough, especially if this time around is perhaps your first time without somebody who was special to you and especially meaningful for this time of year, or if you're in a situation where you're wondering if this season might be yours or someone else's last like it. This can be a season of lonely exile. And if that's what you're bringing with you in here today, I'm here to say that you are in the right place because we do lonely exile here in church. We always have. And we know what to do with loneliness and exile, and that is to lament. You see, lament is a form of prayer. Lament is a prayer. To lament is to address God with our hurt and our disappointment with the trust that God knows it, even that God experiences some of it with us. That's what a lament is. And the Bible is filled with laments. You think of Job. You know what I'm talking about? Job. Job laments at one point, oh, that I knew where I might find God. The psalmist in the Bible laments, oh, that I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. Even Jesus laments, the people who are surrounding him and failing to believe in him. He says, oh, faithless and unbelieving generation. And of course, the prophet Isaiah, who we just heard, 
laments. He laments directly to God. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. You see, the prophet is standing in the middle of a world where things are not as they should be. Things are not, the prophet knows for sure, not the way God would have them to be. There is suffering, immense suffering. There is grief and disappointment and terror all around as the prophet's own people are enduring these days and days and days of darkness and calamity. That sounds very dramatic, doesn't it? <laughs> it's very biblical. Surely that's, surely that's not the world that we live in. But I don't have to tell you that there is a great deal in our world to be lamented as well. And you don't need me to stand up here and recite negative news headlines to show you how well informed I am. Also, what's written about at nytimes.com or what you find on Fox or MSNBC, those are hardly the most important things that impact our life and that we need to know about. Still, we know enough to know that the world is not as God would have it to be. God's beloved children are trampled into the dust all over the place in cities and towns and villages and places that only God has an eye on. And we know, we know, because how could we not know that this is not the way that God would have things to be? And we know that it's all more than we can fix. So we do what we can. We pray and we, we lament. We raise our voices to heaven in protest and in a plea for God to do something about it. Oh yeah, God. Where is, where is God anyway in the middle of all this mess? God. God seems to be hiding. And so the words of the prophet that we've heard this afternoon are a summons to God. Like, show yourself. Tear open the heavens. Make yourself known. You're God. Shake it all up. Burn it all down if you have to. But just get here and get involved. See, Isaiah... The prophet paid attention in Sunday school. He knows the word. He knows the old, old stories about the all-powerful God decisively getting involved in human affairs. The story of creation. God said, let there be light, and poof, there was light in a word. The story of the flood, the rains for 40 days and 40 nights, and then a word of promise, a rainbow in the sky to never do it again. And the most important word from the old, old stories, the word of liberation, freedom. God heard the cries of the people who are in misery and oppression and enslaved and delivered them through a parted sea to a promised land. The story of God speaks a clear word. Isaiah knows, we know, that God is able and willing to intervene in the world on behalf of the oppressed and the destitute. And so Isaiah reminds God of God's own story. He says, you did awesome deeds that we didn't expect. You came down before. And now the prophet says that God is hiding from us, that God has hidden God's face. That's a different word. That's a hard word. Hiding. Like in a child's game? Like hide and seek? Hiding like the way you hide your face and pretend to be asleep after you and your spouse have had a fight? Hiding? If I understand what the prophet is asserting here, it has something to do with the fact that God can seem to be hiding sometimes because God is God and we are not. Let me say that again. God is God, and we are not. This is, after all, one of the most fundamental assertions the Bible makes about God, that God is other than us. The Bible uses the word holy to describe God, and in that Exodus story, God appears on the mountain and reveals God's self and gives the law. There's an earthquake, and there's fire, and Moses turns his face away because nobody can look at God. There is something about God that is hidden from us always because God is God. But more than that, Isaiah 
has witnessed a really bad stretch in the national and religious life of his people, and he knows clearly that God is not a possession. God is not a possession that the people can just pull out of a drawer of religious trinkets when it suits them and then put it back in the drawer when they're bored. God loves us too much to relate to us in that way. God loves us enough to sometimes be hidden from us, perhaps in the way that a parent decides at times to remain hidden from a child they love, perhaps in a way that they decide not to bail a child out this time. I knew some parents at a, the church I served in California who had a terrible, terrible, terrible time with their son in his teenage years. Of course, they loved him. They loved him more than anything. They loved him more than themselves. But their love for him was not enough to curb his temper, was not enough to keep him away from substances or to prevent him from getting arrested every other week. They were afraid for him, and they came to be afraid of him. And so... When he was 18, one of them got an opportunity to take a job out of state and they took it and they moved away. And they didn't tell him where they were going for a time. And they, wouldn't, they weren't sure, because how could you be sure about a decision like that? But they believed that they were doing the good thing for him in that season by removing themselves from him, by hiding from him for a time, if you will, by withdrawing from him they were trying to love him, and they felt it as the hardest demand that love could make of them. Perhaps in those seasons where it feels like God is hidden from us, there is good news to be found, good news of mercy and love. Because so much of the good news that we find in the scriptures, the good news that Jesus shares with people, has to do with hidden things. For Jesus, whose coming we await in Advent, the truth that is obscured is not less true for its being unclear and not obvious. Rather, the truest things may be those things that seem the most hidden from us. And so Jesus tells us that the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls that are hidden. He tells us that the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. Jesus says, I'll proclaim what's been hidden since the foundation of the world. He prays, I thank you, God, for you've hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent. Much of Jesus' teaching remains hidden from people in its meaning, and that is not a shortcoming. Rather, the faith of Jesus prays, loves, and serves, even when the meaning of all of it, even when God seems hidden from our point of view. And so when we place our faith in Jesus, we entrust ourselves and our lives to the one who a letter in the New Testament, the letter to the Colossians, calls God's mystery, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Hidden. Indeed, that same letter says that our faith in Jesus sets our minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for we have died and our life is hidden with Christ in God. The life of faith is in many ways a hidden life. Our life is hidden with Christ in God. I'm not sure I can parse that all the way out, even if I had like a Greek thesaurus or New Testament. Is there a Greek thesaurus? Concordance is the word I was looking for. But I take the meaning to have something to do with hiddenness not being a bad thing, but rather a good thing, a holy thing. Sometimes we actually take part in that hiddenness when we join with others in seeking to follow Jesus, in loving God, and in loving our neighbor, loving our enemies even, praying to God as a parent, a loving parent, praying for those who persecute others as well as for the ones they persecute. All of that seems to be 
hidden oftentimes in terms of what it means and what it's for. There isn't anything obvious, I don't think, or out in the open about this. It's shrouded in mystery. And when we choose this, when we choose this as our way of life, it won't be clear to people why it makes any sense and why we should do it. The power of it will remain hidden. And that's how we'll know it's for real. So when we come to take communion here in a few moments, we'll be partaking in something else hidden, in a mystery. The mystery of the life of Christ hidden within the communion bread and a shared cup. And that's what it means to call communion a sacrament, that it's, that it's a mystery, that there is something hidden about what it actually is. But it's a mystery that we're invited to take part in physically, not just intellectually, because you don't, you don't grasp the mystery of Christ's body broken for us by reading about it only or, or meditating on it alone, but, but by receiving it, taking in your hand, taking it in. The prophet pleaded with God to come down. In many days, it feels like we are right there with Isaiah, calling out for the same thing. We await God's coming to set things right. And at the same time, during the season of Advent, we ready ourselves to hear again, as if for the first time, that story of how God did come down. How God came down as a baby, born to poor Jewish peasant parents in the stables of an inn that was all booked up. God came down in a way that we didn't expect, and most of us still don't really expect. So when we take this bread and this cup, and we remember that God is still coming down to us, in Christ's body broken for us, Christ's blood shed for us on our behalf, we are joining together when we do that in in the mystery of a sacrament for all to see, the expectant and the oblivious alike. And in doing so, we offer ourselves to God as clay to a potter to be shaped and put to holy use in these coming days, whatever these days may bring. Amen? Amen? So we move to our time in our service now where we take our offering, where we offer our financial gifts to the ministry of the church to help feed and clothe and serve people in this season, as well as offering our own voices, offering our own time and our own energy to help bring about the world that God envisions. So our offering will now be received.
It will be all right. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If those who hear my voice will open the door, I will come into them and eat with them and they with me. So friends, I'm here to tell you that this is the Lord's table and that our Savior invites all of those who hear his voice in whatever way to come and to share in this feast that he has prepared. And as we come to this table, we pray. So please pray with me. Gather around this table, we offer our prayers to God, saying together, God of our salvation, and then responding, hear our prayer. So let's try that. God of our salvation, God, a voice cries out, oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. God of our salvation, hear our prayer. Come down to your church. Let us be a sign of your promised realm and make us ready to meet our Savior when he comes again in glory. God of our salvation, hear our prayer. Come down to your world. Tear apart all that divides your children and bring justice and equality to every land and let all creatures know your saving love. God of our salvation, hear our prayer. Come down to this community and to the communities where we live. Make yourself known among us in your goodness and your mercy. Kindle a passion in us to do right and cleanse us from all corruption. God of our salvation, hear our prayer. Come down to all of our loved ones. Let your tender mercy shine on them. Give light to those who wait in darkness and guide their feet into the path of peace. God of our salvation, hear our prayer. Come down to all of us, O Lord, your people, that you may delight in the work of our hands and that we may rejoice when your reign of glory comes. Through Christ, we pray, who teaches us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, the story says that on the night of his betrayal, Jesus took a loaf of bread and after he had given thanks for it, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and he told them, take and eat, this is my body and it is for you. So do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The scriptures tell us that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again and all manner of things are made well. Amen? Amen. We're going to Receive communion by coming down to the front. There'll be a couple of stations. You'll be given a piece of bread which you can dip into the chalice and then partake and go back to your seat by the side. We also will have a station over here with gluten-free bread and a chalice reserved from that should you need that. Should you need someone to bring the elements to you, just raise your hand and we will do that. So friends, come, all is ready.
Once again, let's pray. God of our hope, we give you thanks that you have given us this foretaste of the justice and the righteousness and the peace of your promised new creation that we await. Strengthen us as we go from here with this heavenly food, as we seek to serve your heavenly realm. Lead us to live in joyful expectation of the coming again in glory of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. So it comes in the morning, and we can also take it with us as we exit the sanctuary today. So please rise as you are able so we can put some of that joy in our pocket and take it with us. Our final hymn is He Came Down to go with the sermon text. And uh, yeah, just please join me in singing. One, two, three.